Buon pomeriggio a tutte e tutti, ancora una volta in occasione di un incontro sulle lingue live che questa sera vede tra i relatori eh, Silvia Chini che adesso comparirà e che saluteremo. Eccola Buon qua. Buon pomeriggio a tutti, ciao Laura. Eh, il tema di quest'oggi riguarda la letteratura contemporanea e anche come coniugare diciamo, i vantaggi del molteplice lavoro tra lingua e letteratura e anche poi ovviamente ci porterà a ragionare di quali temi eh, possono entrare nella nostra classe, nella nostra lezione, come sempre, anche se chi ci segue da un po' queste notizie, informazioni e modalità le conosce già, però insomma le diamo eh, per chi invece è con noi la prima volta, qualche indicazione di base, poi io lascerò la parola a Silvia e invece la riprenderò per rivolgerle le domande che mentre lei parla voi potrete inserire alla pagina tuadomanda.it e in questo caso dovrete indicare il codice evento 3533 ehm, e, e quindi insomma poi Silvia ne discuterà e ne parlerà con me. Eh, per chi volesse accedere allo, allo streaming in differita l'attestato sarà disponibile eh, solo ai partecipanti che avranno effettuato l'accesso dalla mail di conferma di iscrizione ma entro la mezzanotte di oggi il video resta disponibile sul canale di YouTube, eh, le slide verranno caricate nella sezione archivio webinar del nostro sito e di tanto in tanto appunto vi verrà, la, 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 vi verrà ricordato l'indirizzo, il codice dell'evento eh, che la regia incolla nella chat di YouTube e appunto che corrisponde al codice 3533. Eh, io vi lascio nelle capaci mani di Silvia e riprendo la parola alla fine. Vi auguro un buon webinar. A dopo, grazie. Good afternoon, everybody. It's always a pleasure to spend some time with you. And today we will concentrate on contemporary literature. So the word contemporary means living, existing, belonging to the present. And so when we speak about contemporary literature, we are considering something written now, speaking about the now. So generally the label contemporary literature is given to the works written after the Second World War or after 1940. Um, I've always found this definition pretty, pretty unclear. There are a lot of definitions about contemporary literature. Uh, many agree on the fact that contemporary literature shows connection to current events, through realistic characters, uh, giving some socio-economic messages. And genres include in this period, included in this period, sorry, span from short stories to plays, from memories to uh, non-fiction, from autobiographies to many more. So this webinar will focus on the benefits of including contemporary literature uh, in our programs. I'm not saying that Shakespeare and Oscar Wilde are old fashioned. I'm just taking into consideration the possibility um, of, let's say, going beyond our borders, okay, both for language and uh, literature. So let's start with some of the benefits um, of using contemporary literature in class. I would like to start from this quotation by a German colleague I had the pleasure to work with. And she used to say that the main reason contemporary literature is not read in schools is that it is contemporary. So classics read in our classes are generally analyzed for symbols, themes, uh, social and historical background. And I think that sometimes there is the misconception that today's literature can't be analyzed in the same way. Well, I strongly believe that not only um, Contemporary literature has all the characteristics to be analyzed in the same way, but it has also other benefits. Uh, so, for example, it will allow students to feel more engaged. It will allow our students to see that literature is not something old fashioned. Uh, they can see that the issues taken into consideration by Shakespeare are still relevant nowadays, uh, that the problems are the same or they can read about something they're experiencing. We're speaking in a few minutes about a novel focused on, uh, unfortunately, the COVID experience. So uh, in this case, it will be easier for them to relate to the context, to the background. Another relevant benefit, in my opinion, is the diversity that characterizes contemporary literature. 
So up to the 19th century, um, it's difficult to find female authors, minority novelists. Um, the presentation of the perspectives of various ethnicities, uh, genders and other things is vital, I think, to students because literature in our classes is not just for the pleasure of reading and analyzing things. Uh, but in my opinion, it is also the starting point of uh, conversations, uh, mature conversations with our students. And last but not least, I think that contemporary literature is good for uh, language. Uh, so to teach some aspects, to teach vocabulary, to teach language, English language. We can speak for ages about contemporary literature, contemporary novels and other things. Uh, but in this webinar, in my next slides, I will take into consideration I will speak only about the novels I've used in class. So I will give you some examples. And as usual, please feel free to share if you have other titles, other ideas, because it will be useful for everybody. So let's start with some ideas for uh, lower levels, OK? Uh, contemporary literature for language teaching. Uh, you have here three uh, completely different novels. Um, Obviously, they're not meant to replace the textbook, uh, but to boost what your students learn in your lessons, okay? After using the textbook you're using, you can, um, you can give your students the possibility to read and to practice using a different thing, not just the textbook. The first one, the first one is um, Harbour Me. And well, in this book, in this novel, six kids meet, uh, meet once a week to chat with no adults. Uh, they discover that it's good to speak about their fears, to speak about racism, to speak about friendship, to speak about feelings, okay? And um, you can use this book uh, not only to speak about uh, friendship and feelings and um, racism or the topics listed in the book, but you can also use this book to practice uh, verb tenses uh, and um, vocabulary speaking about friendship, for example. Uh, you can see here a passage taken from the book and you can see here um, uh, a cue card, an IELTS cue card of the speaking task too. So describe a good friend. This is just an example. Uh, so after using your textbook and uh, speaking about friendship or um, teaching the adjectives that um, make a good friend, okay? You can read this book with your students and you can work on present tenses, past tenses. It's pretty easy. It's meant for lower levels and you can speak about friendship. Uh, so as you can see, grammar and vocabulary at the same time. The second one is the easiest. Uh, it's a graphic novel. It's an action graphic novel. And uh, in this novel, the girl, uh, the protagonist must protect her city from an army of potatoes, okay? Uh, it's good for lower levels because you can work with pictures. I'm not explaining here anything about working with pictures because we've spent a lot of time in our last webinar uh, speaking about how uh, to work with pictures in, in our lessons. So if you're interested, you can go and watch our last webinar to have uh, some good ideas. So you can work with pictures and you can practice once again present tenses because, as I said before, this is the easiest of the three uh, novels. But you can also um, you can also work on vocabulary for food, of course, and also identity. Working with graphic novels, especially with lower levels. Um, well, I think it's good for students with special needs, for example, uh, because they can see what they're reading. And uh, I consider this a good starting point uh, for students in general, because it's easier for them to understand and it's easier for them to relate to the context, to the background, and also to the content of the story. The third one uh, is the most difficult of the three. Uh, the third one is see you in the cosmos. And well, this boy wants to launch his iPod into space, okay? Um, with some audio recordings. And uh, in the audio recordings, he describes how life on Earth is. So basically, every chapter gives you the possibility to speak about a different aspect of everyday life. Uh, you know that at the very beginning in our textbooks, we generally speak about daily routine. We generally speak about food. We generally speak about hobbies and sports and friends. 
This is exactly the same thing that the protagonist of this story does. Uh, so we have the possibility of uh, working with vocabulary. Uh, as you can see in the slide, I've uh, put some pictures of a vocabulary treasure hunt. So after working on your textbook, after working on everyday life activities, hobbies, sports, and uh, other things, you can ask your students to go and find the uh, same words you've studied with them in the book, in the novel. And once again, you can ask them to speak um, about different topics taken into consideration in this novel. Uh, of course, everyday life topics uh, with the cue cards, the IELTS cue cards. In this case, they can speak about a sport that they have learned. They can speak about hobbies. They can speak about friends. They can speak about what they do in their free time. As you can see, these are easy tasks. Even if we're speaking about IELTS, in, our, uh, in one of our last webinars, we've spoken about IELTS with lower levels. Uh, even if we're speaking about IELTS, you see that uh, it's also good for lower levels. So once again, I'm not saying that these books are replacing our textbooks, but they are a good opportunity for our students to practice without using textbooks. Um, we can read novels once a week, once every two weeks in class. We can ask our students to read some chapters on their own at home, and then we can work on the chapters in class. It's your choice. It depends on the class you have, of course. Uh, but I think it is a really good idea to work with contemporary literature, even with lower levels. Let's move to level A to B1, okay? Uh, these are three novels that speak about friendship, prejudice, multiculturalism, courage. I will focus on two of them. Uh, the first I will speak about is The Blackbird Girls. Uh, it's the most appreciated by my students. It's a story of friendship, prejudice, courage, the courage to change, the courage to leave everything, with the background of the Chernobyl uh, disaster. Because the two main protagonists, uh, they live in Pripyat at the very beginning of the novel. It's a good starting point for some lessons uh, of Educazione Civica as well. Uh, we've always said that there is always the need to combine language, literature, our programs, Educazione Civica. So this is a good starting point, because in this book you will find um, it's pretty easy and you will find um, material to speak about friendship, material to speak about prejudice, but also material to speak about, as you can see here in the slide, uh, the 2030 goals. Uh, so it's a good way to combine English literature, language and um, and Educazione Civica. Uh, the other one I would like to speak about is uh, the one I mentioned before, New From Here. Uh, so uh, this is a novel about uh, an experience related to COVID-19 pandemics. Um, when COVID hits Hong Kong, the mother of the protagonist of this novel decides to send him to California. Uh, he has two days to prepare, to say goodbye to his father, to say goodbye to his friends, and to say goodbye to his life. Of course, the life in California is not easy at all. You can imagine the atmosphere, prejudice towards Asian people at the beginning of the pandemics. It was the same in Italy. Uh, so this uh, boy has um, the, the experience, ha has to experience a lot of issues. This is a good novel. Uh, to speak, to start conversations about COVID-19 pandemics, about emotions, if you want to teach vocabulary, if you want to investigate the field of emotions, uh, you can see the picture there. I always use the movie Inside Out to give vocabulary about emotions. Uh, you can use this novel to speak about courage, hope, resilience, because this boy, the protagonist of this story, is really brave brave, courageous. He faces a lot of issues, uh, a new life in California, prejudice towards Asian people, as I said before, at the beginning of the pandemics, and a lot of other issues. Uh, moreover, this novel gives the possibility once again to relate to um, Educazione Civica, as you can see there, goal number three, good health and well-being. So once again, one single novel gives you the possibility to speak about a lot of different things. Um, and 
when you speak about courage, hope, and resilience, it happened to me this year to uh, to use this novel in the month of January. So, you know, in January, we have the Holocaust Memorial Day. Uh, so we linked also um, hope and resilience and courage, of course, to the Holocaust Memorial Day. We've spoken about the story of Sir Winston, uh, Sir Nicholas Winton. Uh, so it was a good uh, link even to... Uh, history and the Holocaust Memorial Day. But apart from that, it gives you, this novel gives you really the possibility to speak about a lot of things and to practice a lot of vocabulary you would generally teach uh, in class. Grammar is easy in this novel. We have present tenses, past tenses, some present perfect and present perfect uh, and future. So it's uh, perfect for levels A to B1. Okay. Um, as you see, there are endless possibilities, okay, to boost what you what you do with your textbook. Uh, we can give a book every th two months. We can give a book every four months. We can decide to read uh, once a week with our students in class, once every two weeks. Uh, it doesn't matter. It depends on the class, as I said before. But the most important thing is that our students have the possibility to uh, go beyond the borders of our textbook so they will understand they will see that language is really used they, they will appreciate the use of language in a real context okay and they will start approaching um literature because as we know starting from the third year they will have uh, a literature course so why not starting before why not beginning with something easy that gives them the possibility to uh relate language and literature, language, the language uh, used in the textbook with something real, with stories they can relate to, it can be a possibility. It's not compulsory, of course, but it's a good idea, in my opinion. We've considered contemporary literature to teach language. Now I would like to spend some time considering uh, contemporary literature in literature classes, okay? If you follow a thematic approach, okay, instead of using the chronological one, contemporary literature gives you the opportunity to link past and present. But if not, if you're following a, a chronological order, you can still use contemporary literature to give your students uh, different perspectives, okay, and show them different attitudes towards a specific historical events. Uh, and I think um, it's a good idea to show, always to show them that uh, literature is not, I know I've said it before, but that literature is not something old fashioned, that literature, literature is still relevant nowadays. Uh, and I think contemporary literature is a good uh, starting point to do this. Um, let's consider for a second, before speaking about different topics, different themes, let's speak for a second um, the genre, about the genre of graphic novels. Uh, this genre is hardly ever taken into consideration in our programs. Here you have three of the most famous graphic novels. Um, I think that graphic novels, the good ones, uh, have um, depth of plot, character development. Uh, well, basically the same areas we analyze with classics, but also some elements related to cinema. Of course, they're graphic novels. Um, and this allows uh, teachers, okay, to work on both levels, okay, language and images, okay, helping students develop liter literacy in the interpretation of image for meaning, I mean. Moreover, as I said before, when we were speaking about the, um, the graphic novel for lower levels for language, um, I think that um, it's easier for students to relate uh, to um, to relate text when they can see it, okay? The three novels you see here are popular. Anyway, Mouse, uh, you know it, it's about the Second World War. It's the first graphic novel to win the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, March is about, this is book one, okay? Uh, it's about the civil rights movement. And Persepolis uh, is about Iran uh, in the 80s. I will uh, focus on some aspects. Um, as I said before, I strongly believe that uh, graphic novels 
can be analyzed almost in the same way that we analyze classics. So we can analyze literacy, literary devices, we can analyze the plot, the setting, we can analyze the, the, the context. Um, there are often flashbacks in uh, graphic novels. We can analyze characters uh, through its design. For example, in the picture you see here, uh, taken, by, uh, taken from Mouse, uh, you can ask your students to describe the faces, to describe the characters in Mouse. Why do you think Spiegelman drew the characters this way? So this is a good uh, starting point, for example, not just for this graphic novel, but even for the others, to understand uh, the psychology of the character. So it's slightly different, but as you can see, we can analyze this exactly the same way. The second... Uh, the second picture you see here uh, is taken from March, okay? As I said before, um, March speaks about the civil rights movement. Uh, so the setting is as important as in classics. But moreover, here we have something to see. We can see the setting. In this case, this bridge is super famous, super important for the civil rights movement. So this is another way, this is another uh, possibility your students have to relate, to empathize with the characters, with the story, and even with the setting, because they have the possibility to see it. The last one is taken from Persepolis, and once again, you have something to see. Once again, there is a clear distinction between the protagonist, as you can see, and the rest of the crowd. So once again, why did the author decide to draw them in that way? So this is something that we can do with our students. So starting from the pictures and analyzing the context, then going to the text and analyzing the text. So this is exactly the same thing we do with Oscar Wilde, we do with Shakespeare, we do with uh, the war poets and uh, the rest of the authors that we generally take into consideration in our programs. But it's different. This is contemporary literature. So why not thinking about using one or two pages, if not the entire novel, uh, in our programs, I think that our students will appreciate. Um, I would like to give you some ideas um, on how to use uh, contemporary literature linked to something that we generally do in class, okay? Um, as I said before, um, contemporary literature gives our students the opportunity to understand that the literature is still re relevant today. That some of the issues of the past are the issues of our society as well. And I strongly believe that especially um, with our students, especially with the students from the third year on, okay, from level B1 on, let's say, literature should be the basis of conversations that goes beyond what's the plot. Uh, what can you tell me about the main character? Or uh, what are the main themes of this novel? Um, here you will find in this slide and in the next slides, you will find some examples, okay, uh, taken from LitHub or taken from great inspirations or taken from uh, what I did with my classes um, that can give you the possibility to start from the novel and to speak about something else, to go beyond the usual questions, uh, what are the main elements of the plot? Um, the novels here are perfect uh, connections to some of the novels we always teach. So when we teach the picture of Dorian Gray, when we teach Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and we focus on the theme of the double, the doppelganger, uh, in every story we have an appearance, a surface, and an essence, so something behind. And the three novels you see here, uh, the, the four, to be honest, uh, you see here, are uh, four novels that are based on the same concept. So showing our students that the problem is still relevant nowadays, even with different, in a different way, okay, but the problem is still relevant nowadays. In Ask Me No Questions, for example, uh, we have some immigrants from Bangladesh. Um, they decide to go to the United States after the 9-11 attacks. So this family has expired documents and uh, the quintessential quotation is the title, basically, ask me no questions and I will tell you no lies. I can't tell you who I am because I'm an illegal immigrant. I'm trying to find a new house, a new uh, homeland, a new everything. But in this moment, I can't tell you the truth. Okay. 
So once again, we have an appearance, of course, in a different way. It's not like Dorian Gray, but we have an appearance and an essay and, and an essence, sorry, in two completely different ways. Uh, but both useful to speak about how relevant this aspect is still in our society. The other one by Benjamin Zephaniah, same thing. We have um, the protagonist that has to deal with the problem of uh, physical appearance. Okay, so uh, physical appearance and uh, who I really am. So exactly the same. The last one, the circle, uh, is quite interesting. It was published in 2013. Okay, it's a dystopian novel that takes into consideration uh, George Orwell, Orwell, 1984. So paraphrasing Orwell, the slogan that you find in this novel is secrets are lies, sharing is caring, privacy is theft. So basically the circle is a society, okay, an internet society that tries to create a fully transparent world through the internet. So it's basically the effect of social media on our lives. So who I am in real life and who I am in, uh, on the social media, okay, on internet. So it's quite difficult, but in my opinion, it's super interesting. I've read a couple of passages with my Quinta and uh, after reading Orwell, okay. And it's super interesting to speak about the problem the, the problem in our society. So, yes, we speak about the picture, picture of Dorian Gray, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde being and appearing, but we're doing exactly the same thing now with internet, with social media. So it's really interesting, even if it's a bit difficult to read. But with a Quinta, you have a fifth year, you can do that. Um, well, this slide focuses on multicultural literature because I'm sure that almost everybody has uh, in the program something related to multiculturalism, from a passage to India, to Heart of Darkness, to other things. Uh, well, uh, here there are three novels that show uh, how some issues of the past uh, are still relevant today. The first one, The Help, was published in 2009. I love it. I always read it. I always include it in my fifth year program. Uh, I do not only appreciate the story. I'm sure you all know the story. Uh, set in the 60s in the southern states of the United States. Uh, so I do not just appreciate the content of the story. But I also like the way it's written. Because there are three narrators. You know, the main protagonists are Skeeter, uh, Minnie and Abelene. And so the, the, the three main protagonists are the three narrators. So you can see the same story uh, written in three completely different styles with three different types of language, okay? Because in every narrator uses uh, his own, her own slang and uh, colloquialisms and other things uh, under three different perspectives. So it's really good to understand even the role of the narrator. I'm sure you have, you've seen the movie and even our students have seen the movie. So it's also interesting to watch the movie, to read the novel and to understand how the same situation, the same event can be perceived in three completely different ways. The second one and uh, the third ones are still, of course, uh, about multiculturalism. The Secret Life of Bees. These are materials taken from uh, great inspiration. So you can just go, if you have Lit Hub, you can go on Hub Scuola, you can choose Lead Hub, Materiale Docente, and in Materiale Docente you will find the complete, the full guide, the book and the guide uh, of great inspirations. So you will find a lot of ready-made material uh, to use in class. And this in particular, these two pages are in the section for uh, Liceo Linguistico, but of course you can use it uh, in the school you teach, of course, in the school you work in. So The Secret Life of Bees, I was saying, was published in 2002. And I really like this book. Uh, the main protagonist, Lily, is a 14-year-old girl, uh, a white girl, and she escapes with her black maid uh, called Rosaline. And they find a shelter in the south of the United States uh, in the home of three beekeeper, beekeeping sisters, black beekeeping sisters. Basically, it's the problem of... Um, 
racism seen, seen from another perspective. So we have the only white girl in a community of black people, okay? Um, and it's a story of sadness and love, of hope and forgiveness, prejudice and justice. And it's told through uh, the eyes of a beekeeper, so through the life of bees, the secret life of bees, because bees um, have um, a society which is secret because nobody knows it, knows about it. Uh, and they have some rituals, they have some, um, they have an organization which is similar to our society, okay? But it's secret because nobody knows it. Uh, there is also the movie, and even the movie is quite interesting. This gives you the possibility not only to speak about multiculturalism and racism, but to also speak about some fundamental facts, some fundamental uh, events in the history of the United States, as you can see from the uh, picture taken from Great Inspiration. The last one, The Beekeeper of Aleppo, uh, published in 2019, it's a novel that speaks about something that now is relevant more than ever, I would say. So uh, people seeking refuge, okay. Uh, the two protagonists of this story have a normal life in Aleppo when war broke out. And it's basically the story of their journey through Turkey, Greece and Britain and all the issues, of course, they have to face. This is unfortunately a super relevant topic nowadays, and it gives the possibility to speak about even the crisis we are experiences we are experiencing uh, in those days, um, in in our days, in our society. Unfortunately, um, of course, uh, more than past present connections, as I said before, you can relate these novels once again to Educazione Civica. Because you can speak about refugees, you can speak about racism, you can speak about uh, gender equality, you can speak about all the things we um, have to take into consideration for Educazione Civica. There are a couple of texts more that I wanted to put there. Uh, Refugee Blues, nice poem I generally use with my fifth year students uh, by Odin that speaks about Jewish people escaping from Germany and trying to find... Uh, a place to live at the very, very beginning. It was written in 1939, so at the very, very beginning of the Second World War. Um, and it focuses on the role of the society. So in that poem, we have uh, perpetrators, victims, and spectators. And it focuses, the poet focuses on the role of spectators. So the role of the people who had the possibility to help these refugees, but they basically don't do anything. And this is a good starting point for conversations about our situation nowadays. And the other one is a famous telephone conversation um, uh, in which basically you will see uh, all the prejudice and, um, yes, prejudice and racism uh, that this uh, great author has to, to face. Speaking about a completely different topic, um, when we teach Oliver Twist, we all teach Oliver Twist in our classes. Uh, when we teach about uh, when we teach Oliver Twist, we generally take into consideration child labor. Uh, we generally take into consideration poverty. We generally take into consideration um, difficulties and issues in childhood. Uh, so these three novels you see here. Um, are three novels that have something in common with Oliver Twist. Uh, so something that shows our students that unfortunately the problem is still here. The problem is still relevant nowadays. Um, I will start from the last one, Rabbit Proof Fence. Uh, Rabbit Proof Fence is uh, a short but engaging story um, of three girls, basically, who escaped from an Aboriginal center in Australia. Okay, And they follow the Rabbit Proof Fence to go home. Um, the first, especially the first part of the novel, uh, concentrates on um, the harsh conditions in the center. And the, the harsh, uh, harsh conditions in the center are similar to the conditions that Oliver Twist has to face, uh, has to experience um, in the workhouse. So a completely different setting. We're in Australia, completely different period. But unfortunately, the conditions of ch some children are still the same. Uh, the one in the middle, Black Boy, uh, is a partially autobiographical novel published in 1945, so at the very beginning of what we call contemporary literature. And it's divided into two parts. Uh, the, first, uh, the first part speaks about uh, the childhood of um, the author, uh, Richard Wright, 
Uh, the second part uh, speaks about the very beginning of his career as a writer in um, Chicago. And, well, his childhood is marked once again by extreme poverty, poverty and hunger. And some of the passages of this novel are exactly the same that we can find in uh, Oliver Twist. And once again, the harsh conditions he had to face in his life. The last one is the easiest, so you can use it even with lower levels. The last one is the, uh, which is the first here, sorry, uh, the easiest, called Boys Without Names, okay? It's set in India, in Mumbai, and uh, basically the child of this family called uh, Gopal, okay, Gopal is the name of the main protagonist, is kidnapped and forced to work with other five children in a factory. Um, it's with, with other five boys, yes, if I remember. It's the it's a eye-opening story, I would say, uh, on child labor in the world. So it's a good starting point for uh, conversations about child labor in the world nowadays. And well, last but not least, we open the huge chapter of war literature. There are so many contemporary novels about war literature, and uh, it's one of the topics I like the most. Uh, but, of course, I can't speak about every single uh, novel we have the possibility to use in class. I will only speak about uh, the five here. So they concentrate, they are on different uh, wars. Uh, the first one is on the Vietnam War and, well, the rest is on the basically the Second World War. The easiest here is the second one, Ausländer by Paul Doswell. And they all speak about specific um specific events uh specific aspects of the second world war for example the rose code is about uh the women in bletchley park during the second world war trying to break the codes of the enemy uh auslander is um about a boy uh who is adopted in germany uh but he's jewish okay and he's adopted by a nazi family and secretly he starts helping uh, other Jewish families in Germany. Uh, the last one, for example, is about the role of the American library in Paris during the war. So they all concentrate on a specific uh, event, on specific events or particular situations of the war. When we teach uh, war literature in our classes, we generally take into consideration the war poets for World War I, uh, Hemingway, in some cases we consider Odin, uh, they're great, okay. I always, I always speak about them, but they always concentrate. How can I put this? Uh, on the same things, okay. Of course, we have to speak about uh, the facts that they take into consideration. So, soldiers in the trenches for the First World War and uh, all the rest uh, that I'm sure you know. But I mean, taking into consideration some aspects, tiny aspects or different aspects, can be engaging for our students. Um, at the beginning of the last year, I generally give a list of contemporary novels about war and ask my students to choose one. In class, we deal with the war poets, Odin, Hemingway, and so on, as I said before. And then I ask them to prepare one lesson based on the book they've read. In this way, um, the class has the possibility to experience, to, to know at least, other aspects of the war they study in history, in art history, in English. Uh, some aspects that are generally less taken into consideration. And I think that they feel more engaged, first of all, because they can choose something to read. Okay, uh, I have people who are more interested in uh, secret codes, so they choose the Rose Code. I have... Uh, um, students that are more interested in the Vietnam War, for example, and they choose the beautiful, the things they carried, uh, and they have the possibility to investigate what they like. And they have the possibility to investigate something more than uh, the First and the Second World War. This year, for the first time, to be honest, I started taking into consideration in my literature classes with my Quinta, with my um, last year, uh, even the Bosnian War. We've read some poems, uh, written by um, war correspondents um, of, in the Bosnian War. And they were super interested because it was something near. It was something they knew about. Uh, so I think that contemporary literature has the power of uh, at least engaging our students a bit. 
in the last minutes of this webinar, I would like to um, speak about the response to reading assignments. Okay, we generally ask our students to read, and then what can we ask them? To write a paragraph, to write an essay, uh, to prepare presentations. Yes, uh, there are other possibilities that we can take into consideration. For lower levels, this one, book snaps. Um, I think this one can be a good, uh, a good way, a good idea to help them at least uh, starting interacting, let's say, uh, with literature. Okay, book snaps uh, is a creative way, basically, to allow annotation and sharing of passages while making personal connection uh, connections with the content. Okay, it's a visual, basically, as you can see here in the pictures. It's a visual representation of one's learning and reasoning, okay? It can be digital or not. If it's digital, if you choose for the digital version, you can use Google Drawings, Google Slides, Picolage, and other, um, other programs. Uh, but in general, basically, students can highlight, draw emojis, write keywords, use colors, highlight, underline, um, to support their reflection, okay? This strategy, allows our students to focus on specific aspects of the text in a creative approach. It's easier, okay? And it's a good starting point for lower levels or for the people that for the first time uh, read a text in English, a book in English, okay? If you choose the digital version, you can upload the book page or if you choose the, the if you don't choose the, the digital version, you simply make a photocopy, okay? And once the image is uploaded, additional images can be added or keywords, as I said before, or colors. I've seen that, especially at the very beginning, when they start approaching English literature, this is a good and easy, easy way to help students react to the text and not simply reading and repeating, okay? Or reading and trying to understand every single word, okay? Uh, but not just, it's not, it doesn't just help students react to the text but it helps them react to others reflection because when you share the book snaps everybody has the possibility to to see uh the classmates reflections basically okay and it's the starting point it's the beginning the very beginning it's a starting point for a dialogue around the common text and not simply what's the main topic of this page what's the main um the main uh, element of the plot and other things then we have more common uh, things such as Spotify playlists. So you can ask your students, I always do this with Shakespeare, uh, ask your students to create a playlist on Spotify uh, based on the novel or the, the play or the poem or the collection of poems they, they read, we've read in class or we've analyzed, uh, to give a specific song to each character or to each chapter or to each event of the story of the plot and to give a reason, of course, to say why. Oh, another thing, um, I generally do this in the fourth year, okay? Ask them to create podcast series. Uh, they create podcasts, episodes, um, trying to engage the audience, okay? And explain a specific aspect of the novel or once again, the poem or the play we've taken into consideration. So, um, I'm, as I said before, as I said at the beginning, I'm not here to say that contemporary literature must replace classics. No, absolutely not. But um, I think that contemporary literature has uh, the power to give our students another possibility to reflect on what they are reading, to relate to what they're reading. And I like this quotation, reading without reflecting is like eating without digesting. So basically, I think that contemporary literature can be a good way to go beyond our usual borders. And as I said before, we always have the need of, um, of combining language, literature, educazione uh, civica, and a lot of other things. And contemporary literature can be a good, um, a good source of inspiration to combine all the pieces of our programs. Thank you.
Grazie Silvia, grazie come sempre. Allora intanto condivido magari alcune, alcuni altri titoli che mentre tu parlavi appunto venivano fuori come spunti nel caso qualcun altro eh, li, avesse, li avesse persi. Allora sono stati citati i Refugee Blues di Oden che poi tu stessa hai ritirato in ballo, eh, War Horse sulla Prima Guerra Bello. Mondiale, Black Dogs, quindi McEwan, Seconda Guerra Mondiale, Knight e eh, Lee Wiesel. Souls to the Sea, Unknown Season, quindi Oden di nuovo, e quindi insomma un bel pacchetto di possibilità e di testi che in qualche modo eh, possono esserci di spunto nel momento in cui vogliamo impostare un lavoro di questo genere. Souls to the Sea è di un'autrice, a, a me piace da morire, la uso spessissimo, lei è Ruta Shepetis e ha scritto e... tantissimo proprio sulla, su un aspetto mai preso in considerazione della Seconda Guerra Mondiale, quindi... Eh, la, dal punto di vista della Lituania, lei è litu di origini lituane, quindi um, Between Shades of Grey è un testo che usiamo spessissimo per parlare proprio della seconda guerra mondiale da un altro punto di vista. Punto di vista. Eh, quindi diciamo buoni suggerimenti sono, sono Grazie. Mentre, mentre, tu, mentre tu parlavi. Eh, qualcuno chiede, quindi forse magari precisiamo e diamo delle indicazioni un po' più precise, se tutti gli extracts che tu hai citato fanno parte di Litab non è esattamente così eh, non so se appunto vuoi raccontare tu che cosa sta dentro Litab che è comunque un testo di letteratura che ha un percorso al suo interno che però è specificamente dedicato sì alla letteratura contemporanea ma alla letteratura contemporanea Young Adults qualche pagina o qualche sì. frammento visto che tu l'hai indicato però poi il lavoro che abbiamo fatto che tu hai fatto Uh, sta appunto in un testo che è un testo per l'insegnante che è questo Great Inspirations che, che Silvia ha citato e appunto ecco, poi se vuoi rispondere tu come poi da quello che si trova in Great Inspirations tu ti sei allargata ecco a te la parola allora sì ci sono alcuni frammenti di questo percorso di Litab un percorso molto interessante perché eh, a parte che è contrassegnato sempre dallo stesso colore quindi anche facilmente riconoscibile a proprio a livello no. visivo le pagine ma è un percorso molto interessante che eh, con la letteratura Young Adult ehm, riprende i temi dell'unità in questione, ecco, e, e, e fa vedere come eh, questi, esattamente quello che ci siamo detti adesso, come questi siano ancora rilevanti e importanti nella letteratura contemporanea, in particolare nella letteratura Young Adult. Ci sono, come ho detto, alcune cose prese da Great Inspirations, che è questo volumetto, eh, che abbiamo fatto, eh, l'ultima parte, diciamo, corposa parte, eh, le curvature per i vari licei eh, si basano fondamentalmente tutti su letteratura contemporanea, ovviamente noi per eh, necessità, diciamo, di chiarezza li abbiamo divisi, liceo classico, scientifico, però eh, nulla è, è, infatti, nulla è eh, in positivo e, e quindi ecco, ci sono tantissime, tantissimi spunti. Io poi ho messo, come dicevo all'inizio, cose, cose che uso, eh, che ho provato, che ho usato in classe, che uso costantemente o che magari uso a seconda della classe che mi trovo di fronte. Devo dire la verità, eh, come faccio a sceglierli? Io di solito vado su Google, lo dico, scrivo reading assignment e vado a vedere i reading assignment delle varie scuole inglesi piuttosto che americane, vedo che cosa propongono, ovviamente poi te, si tiene anche d'occhio chi vince i vari premi, eccetera, eccetera però sicuramente quei reading assignment che vengono fuori su Google sono una buona, eh, diciamo, una buona base di partenza, ecco. Hai già risposto ad un'altra delle domande ah, ecco. che ho detto, come arrivare a, quindi, a una Lo risposta fiare. senza aver bisogno che io la formulassi. Eh, e invece, senti, qualcuno, anche qui in parte hai già poi risposto, perché appunto mh, hai, hai parlato di come vi muovete in classe in alcune situazioni. Eh, però appunto la domanda precisa era, era appunto, could you give us an idea on how you use novels? How do you organize your literature lessons? Quindi forse come le dosi, come le calibri, di tanto in tanto proponi, ecco un'idea di eh, quantitativa e, e di modalità. Allora, mi rendo conto di essere un po' fuori dagli schemi, io non vado in ordine cronologico, dalla terza in poi, prendo, vado in ordine pseudo-cronologico, mettiamola così, prendo un tema e cerco di analizzarlo a livello cronologico, ok, ma seguendo il filone tematico. Mm. Quindi, per esempio, in terza cominciamo a parlare degli eroi, quindi parliamo, partiamo dal Beowulf, poi ci muoviamo sulla letteratura medievale, così fino ad arrivare alla letteratura contemporanea. Ai ragazzi chiedo di leggere qualcosa degli eroi contemporanei. 
di solito io dalla terza in poi do delle liste eh, da cui scegliere perché sono convintissima che già non amino particolarmente leggere se, se quantomeno cerchiamo di, di fargli scegliere quello sì, che ci può interessare chissà mai che eh, siano un po' più interessati ecco, a leggere eh, a volte diciamo così magari nella prima parte dell'anno il libro per l'estate lo do io uguale per tutti così poi riusciamo a, a lavorarci tutti insieme tendenzialmente alla fine dell'anno gli do tre scelte e poi decidono loro però leggono tutti lo stesso invece nella seconda parte dell'anno leggono dalla lista quindi magari in una classe di 20 ci sono 10 libri diversi e, e quindi ecco poi arriviamo sempre alla letteratura contemporanea anche per esempio in quinta il blocco della letteratura di guerra facciamo prima guerra seconda guerra la guerra del Vietnam quest'anno appunto ci siamo lanciati perché le mie quinte erano particolarmente interessate eh, alla letteratura di guerra quindi abbiamo fatto delle poesie eh, della, della guerra in Bosnia eh, fino poi a, ad arrivare appunto alla lettera, letteratura contemporanea di guerra eh, stessa cosa anche con il capitolo società eh, vediamo la società descritta da Joyce nei Dubliners poi vediamo la società descritta da Orwell vediamo la società in The Help e vedi, quindi io vado, prendo dei grossi temi e poi cerco di andare in ordine cronologico all'interno del tema per far vedere ai ragazzi come ne, primo i, i, diciamo, i temi sono sempre quelli tornano purtroppo alcuni problemi non li abbiamo ancora risolti ecco e Come poi per far tempo. loro capire che, eh, per far loro vedere anche le connessioni, perché chi scrive oggi, per esempio, quella, quel romanzo distopico sul uh, The Circle, eh, si rifà a, a Orwell, a 1984, eh, lo slogan, sempre diviso in tre parti, esattamente la parafrasi, de, una parafrasi di quello che diceva Orwell, eh, però nella nostra società, quindi eh, eh, gli autori del passato sono ancora vivi negli, attori, negli autori del presente. Allora, professoressa Chini, ehm, piacerebbe molto a chi sta partecipando poter vedere le tue liste. Allora, se queste liste non sono così, così private, io propongo questo. Allora, tra i materiali, magari ne ragioniamo insieme, insomma, vediamo come fare e, in che, allora, e il modo potrebbe essere questo. Nel momento in cui vengono depositate le slide che sono state usate per questo webinar, appoggiamo tra i materiali che vanno a capitale di questo, di, diciamo, del, del webinar che è stato appena tenuto, anche un, un file con alcune proposte di liste. Eh, così. Bene, sì, sì, non Potete, sono segrete. Non sono segrete, quindi diciamo, amiamo la sono condivisione, in, in amiamo la condivisione ecco. partecipata e la partecipazione, quindi lo facciamo volentieri. Perché eh? poi c'è il passaparola anche tra colleghi, uno legge un libro, pensa sia interessante, ce lo si passa, e la fine penso succede in tutte le bene. scuole, ecco. Eh, Un'altra cosa, appunto, ulteriore precisazione, qualcuno eh, chiedeva ancora che cos'è questo Great Inspirations, chi sono gli autori, allora una delle autrici, l'autrice la, la, principale è appunto Silvia, è appunto Silvia Chini, eh, Great Inspirations, non vive, dove si può trovare, mi piacerebbe dire in tutte le edicole, come si diceva una volta, non vive di vita propria, è una parte, diciamo una seconda guida dell'insegnante eh, che abbiamo messo accanto alla guida di letteratura della, della letteratura Rizzoli che si intitola appunto l'ITAB. Quindi l'ITAB, oltre ad avere le sue guide dell'insegnante, diciamo classiche, ha questo volume eh, con delle lezioni già organizzate, dei link multimediali, degli spunti di lavoro che appunto ha preparato, ha preparato Silvia, eh, inspiring ideas, insomma, su alcuni filoni, temi, su alcune curvature di licei ed è di fatto, chiamiamola così, la seconda guida dell'insegnante che appoggia l'ITAB. Quindi chi di voi volesse chiedere al rappresentante, perché magari non l'ha ancora sfogliato, non l'ha ancora visto, la copia saggio della letteratura che è l'ITAB, riceve tra i materiali dell'insegnante anche questo volume eh, che si intitola appunto Great Inspirations e che poi resta eh, anche nella versione multimediale perché appunto lì dove vi indicava Silvia tra i materiali dell'insegnante c'è il pdf intero che si può, che si può scaricare. Quindi questo, eh, diciamo, que questo è il quanto, per cui le liste le, le prepariamo volentieri e, e ci, sono, ci sono sempre una serie di brava che io <ride> condivido eh, e che, che appunto affermo e dichiaro appunto senza nessuna esitazione per cui ti ringrazio moltissimo anche questa volta sì, grazie eh, a voi. ringrazio tutte le persone che hanno partecipato grazie di averci ascoltato e, e ci, ci vediamo insomma per, per il prossimo incontro
buona serata. Buona serata.